Welcome back, everyone, to the Risk Intel Podcast, powered by SRA Watchtower, where we share risk intelligence with experts from across the banking industry. I'm your host, Ed Vincent, CEO at SRA Watchtower. Welcome to today's Risk Intel Podcast. Joining me today is Ian Maloney, Senior Vice President and Head of Policy and Regulatory Affairs at the American FinTech Council. Ian brings a unique combination of regulatory experience and perspective to AFC, having worn multiple policy hats in Washington, researched the fintech space in academia, and operated inside a Bass Bank. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate being here. Let's let's start by perhaps giving a little bit of background on the American Fintech Council. Um, and and kind of why you joined there, and then uh, then we can get into some of the, the policy and regulatory issues that are you know uh, confronting the the banks and fintechs in the landscape today. But let's start with a bit of the background for those who are not familiar with the American Fintech Council. Absolutely. So American Fintech Council, or AFC for short, is a trade association. We represent. Uh, a number of the largest financial technology companies or fintech companies and and really the innovative banks that that power those companies along to promote transparent, uh, inclusive, very customer centric uh, benefits and supporting responsible innovation and pragmatic policy decisions and you know really focusing in on you know building out a regulatory framework that encourages innovation. Um, but consumer protected innovation and doesn't just let it run wild and you know act loose and break things and you know we want we want something that that can stand the test of time. So uh, so that's AFC kind of on a, on a high level. Um, why I joined uh, it was the short answer is is really the the team, um, the the members and and also the the mission that AFC is pushing and the issue set. So, um, just by way of background, uh, you know, I appreciate the very nice introduction that, that you offered. Um, you know, I was originally working at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, doing a lot of research in fintech, financial services, that sort of space. Uh, I worked on some global fintech work uh, with the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. Um, and then I decided that research, while wonderful and beneficial, I I wanted to move over to implementation. So I originally uh, went to work for Cross River Bank and then uh, decided to join Phil over at AFC to to really you know focus in on on the pure policy discussions and and really try to uh, bring bring some pragmatic approaches for policy to the fintech space writ large. I love that. I love you know a couple of the the phrases which you use there, which are obviously very purposeful about responsible innovation, right? And then pragmatic policy. I think those will certainly resonate with uh, w- with our listeners. Um, maybe before we get into policy and regulatory issues themselves, um, expand a little bit more on on your role there, right? And 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 you know, it wearing that hat that you're wearing. Um, what are your objectives? What what do you hope to get out of, of being in this policy position? Yeah, so you know, I have the benefit of being head of policy and regulatory affairs. So I I just have to cover everything policy and regulatory affairs, which is very busy. It's a, it's a lot in in the fintech space, and so you know, kind of building on what I had mentioned about developing a, a pragmatic policy solutions and encouraging innovation within financial services. There's a lot that's focused on finding areas where uh, regulations may need to be modernized or changed in order to to still protect consumers, because that I think is is of number one importance, but also, you know, allow these innovative products and services to exist in the space. And, you know, instead of finding ways to to stymie them, you know, find ways to encourage them. And there's been a lot of that development, I think, at the federal side with their Office of Innovations that have come up um, over the last five years. But there's there's great need and opportunity for more development, specifically at the policy end and, and on the examination side, which I'm happy to, to get into a little bit later. But ultimately, we want to see uh, regulations that align incentives to serve consumers that are 
moving away from a, a patchwork regulatory environment, as we've seen with you know some of the, the lending laws and some of the uh, changes to our earned wage access. And, and we really want to have a, a more unified approach um, that ultimately, like I said, it encourages innovation. All right, let's let's get into it then. Let's get into some of these regulatory changes. Let's let's start by looking backwards a little bit. Let's let's go back to to 2023, um, and perhaps you could highlight for us a couple of the regulatory changes that you think are most significant that that a bank you know really should consider when planning their 2024 risk program. Right, that's clearly the space that that we feel like we we know and and operate in. And, um, um, so let's look back at some of those regulatory changes from this prior year that that banks really need to make sure they're considering when they when they plan for 2024. So I think um, for for the fintech space and, and for banks that are thinking about engaging in the in the fintech space, uh, really 2023 was a, a fairly big year as it relates to third party risk management and data privacy. Uh, so from the third party risk management perspective, you have in March of 23, the establishment of OCC's Office of Financial Technology, which elevated that position, gave it a broader remit across the agency. So it's no longer just the, the Office of Innovation, which was exceptionally helpful in providing a front door for innovative banks and fintech companies to come in that are that are under OCC's jurisdiction and learn about you know what they need to be thinking about on a compliance side, a regulatory side. Um, but there is still that that aspect within the Office of Financial Technology, but now it's it's broader than that. And there's you know a deputy comptroller in, in the spot that you know ultimately can have a, a more of a focus on both the examiner side as well as the policy side. So it's it's really recognizing that that impact. Similarly, you see uh, in August of 2023, you had the Federal Reserve that established their novel activities supervision program. And so for entities under the Federal Reserve's jurisdiction, now they're facing uh, you know increased, some would say increased scrutiny. I would say uh, you know, a, a more developed understanding of what innovative banks are doing or trying to do and what the role that fintechs play and ultimately the federal reserve is trying to develop that that understanding a little bit more through novel activities whether it's you know on the crypto side of things or you know more germane to us which is the the bank fintech partnership side of things uh, and then, of course, I, I would be remiss without, you know, if I did not mention, of course, the, the interagency guidance on third party relationships that came out in June of 23. And that really, I think, set the, the interagency supervisory expectations for how banks should be engaging with these fintech companies. And, you know, while it didn't provide, you know, total clarity, I think there's still a lot of areas where we'd like to see uh, increased you know, changes or, or sort of increased guidance uh, around different activities, whether they be lending or payments. Uh, but ultimately, it, it was the first step from, you know, in an interagency level uh, from the regulators to say, hey, we recognize that this bank fintech partnership model is actually, it's functioning, there's, there's a lot here, and we want to provide the supervisory expectations around how banks are engaging because ultimately the liability rests with the banks. So with those three areas there, right, it, it feels like the, the the common theme, if you will, is that you know you, you use the term when you talked about the OCC Office of uh, Financial Technology about you know a front door. Uh, and, it, and it feels like the common theme now with, with all the agencies is that um, there's now an opportunity to, to enter and be proactive and and have those conversations with folks on the other side of the table that that know the space and can can help you know help those banks that want to be proactive in this area right under understand the landscape so it, it's it feels like that that concept of specialization and being proactive come out really across the across the agencies now so I think yes and no um, and it, it really comes back to, if you notice, I, I said the OCC and the Federal Reserve, but I did not necessarily say the FDIC. Um, yeah. And there, so we're starting to see actually 
uh, you know, a little bit of, of a divergence between the regulators and, and sort of the concern that, that I'm having is, is ultimately could this result in regulatory arbitrage and, you know, where yeah. entities that are, you know, we, we want responsible actors in the space and, you know, some irresponsible actors might start to pick and choose which regulator they're going to go with. And so that's, that's the concern that we want to, we want to make sure that we're avoiding. And, you know, on the more, on the practical side of things, we want to make sure that when it comes time for examinations, that the examiners that are operating in this space, that are looking at those innovative banks, are uh, clearly understanding the risk profiles, the complexity, the the requirements that are associated with third parties. Uh, you know, at, that are not just internet service providers as third-party risk management was originally intended. It's, you know, now more of understanding how they relate to core banking functions and reputation risk, compliance risk, all of those sort of things. I think it's important to, to ensure that we have this very unified approach. And so while OCC and the Federal Reserve have uh, you know, still engage and, and have that front door, we're starting to see that things like FDIC's FDI tech program, which was initially, you know, fantastic. We were very excited about what it was able to accomplish and the remit that it was given. You know, that has now moved more internally and been restructured within the agency, ultimately to the, the detriment of those FDIC regulated entities that might not be able to have that front door and that might not be able to engage most effectively with their regulators on the policy side, as well as, um, you know, in turn on the examination side, when the examiners come to their door, you know, we want to make sure that there's good education on both sides. Right. So, so getting goes back to your earlier comments about, about avoiding a patchwork landscape and having a consistent landscape and making sure that, right, that, that foundation is 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 in place across the agencies, not just not just partially uh, in place. Uh, let let's pick up on the other the other theme that you you talked about there around uh, around data privacy, right? So we talked a bit about right, you know, third party risk management. Um, how about unpacking the data privacy to, uh, topic a little bit? So data privacy, this has been a huge issue in 2023, whether it's uh, you know, discussing the potential expansion of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, you know, to data brokers, or, you know, I think the, the big elephant in the room is the CFPB's focus on, uh, you know, creating, implementing Dodd-Frank 1033 uh, through its proposed rulemaking on personal financial data rights. And so this really is almost seven years in the making. And, you know, I, I know when I was back at, at the U.S. Government Accountability Office, you know, I, I worked on a report that was focused on fintech and understanding, you know, how regulators were handling innovation. And we made a recommendation around, you know, implementation of Dodd-Frank 1033 and allowing consumers to access their data, or at least providing some good guidance around that. And it remains partially open to this day. Hopefully, once once the regulators finally finish their rulemaking, that it'll it'll be closed because that's a personal point of pride for me. And you know, I think ultimately it serves the industry better because open banking is is here, and there needs to be the sort of a, a focus on developing a clear, uh, functional regulatory regime for consumers to access their data, as well as to encourage competition within the financial services industry. You know, from the fintech perspective, there's a, a lot of companies that, you know, are, are, they're not the incumbents, obviously. And so they, you know, having consumers be able to, to access their data, pull their data from some incumbents and move it to where they see fit it can it can truly benefit consumers by offering by being able to offer them new products and services at better rates and they you know can access things that will help them ultimately live more productive financial lives so if you if you are then um if you're a bank then looking forward to 2024 any any guidance or, or um, suggestions that you can make, whether it's related to third party risk management or data privacy um, ahead of those banks interacting with regulators? So 
I'll, I'll handle the data privacy first, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to third party risk management, because I think the, the data privacy conversation is really still up in the air, recognizing that the proposed rulemaking that CFPB put forward, the comment period ends on the 29th. And, yeah. uh, you know, there's going to be probably six or so months at least of consideration of the comments that they've received. They've, they've already received quite a number of, of comments. Um, AFC will be providing our comments as well. Uh, and, and I think there's, because it is such a new space for CFPB to engage in, while they've had, you know, seven years that they've been working on this issue, it's, it's so complex and it's so difficult. So there needs to be, I think, once the finalization comes, there's going to be a whole mess of implementation requirements, guidelines that will extend not just in, in 2024, It'll, it'll extend at least four years after finalization. So yeah. there's really, I think there's a long time horizon. There's a lot that's going to go on in the data privacy space uh, in order to just implement uh, the two APIs that are required in the proposed rulemaking, the number of data standardization requirements that are, that are imposed within the proposed rulemaking, or at least proposed, we'll see if they get finalized. And then, you know, ultimately, the the limitations that have been proposed around cross selling uh, of data or of products um, for the benefit of, of consumers, we would argue, and then also targeted advertising, both of which I think you know there there have to, there has to be a good regulatory structure around that that allows for you know companies to actually offer relevant products and services that might benefit a consumer and not have to go through an individual disclosure regime every single time that they want to offer a new product that they can they can really leverage the data that they're receiving from the consumers, permission from the consumers, in order to get them into uh, more responsible credit and more responsible products and services writ large. So there's a there's a there's a bit of there's a bit of wait and see on the data privacy side. Maybe there's some early stage, you know, tech build that goes on around those APIs that you mentioned. Um, but clearly there needs to be more more clarity on on the outcomes of, of those of those rules. And we'll get early looks at that in 2024, but it's not necessarily going to change the way that 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 entities do business coming out of the gate in 2024. Um, how about on the uh, on the TPRM side? Any 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 behavior changes or or recommendations that that banks should think about as they kind of interact with regulators going into 2024 there? So I think you're going to see more of, of what was alluded to in the publications that came in, in 2023. And it'll be more in practice. So you know, the supervisory expectations that were established within the third party risk management guidance, those are coming to the fore in 2024, just based yeah. on on how examination timelines work there, you know, all the the individual, all the entities that were within the examination regime and just happened to get cycled through, uh, you know, at, at the time right. after those expectations came out, like they, they've already started to experience. I think more banks will, will continue to experience what those expectations mean in practice. And as they're related to the complexity of their engagement with, with third parties and, and sort of where that, that comes out. Uh, ultimately, the hope is that we're seeing regulators take a very pragmatic approach that they're going to you know not necessarily try to stymie innovation through regulatory enforcement actions but unfortunately we've started to see already that there's there's some concerns around that that there's the examinations are are not necessarily fitting the complexity of what a, a bank may be engaging with a, with a fintech. So I think there's there's a little cautious a little caution there that we have or a little concern and ultimately we want to see more uh, more activity specific guidance come out so that way banks can have that clear understanding of how they're engaging and what they need to be thinking about before it gets to the examination phase. So that way they can be proactive and responsibly innovate. 
Right. And so I think that gets back to the earlier point of, of getting getting ahead of that examination and, and making sure, right, when those examiners walk in there, they're they're not learning things for the first time. Uh you've done your you've 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 laid the groundwork. And um I think that your other point there of of understanding the standard that you're going to be measured against is is well, that will come into focus, right? As as more of these exams occur, right? Quite frankly, right, and 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 the and the examiners themselves raise their level of you know education and awareness and experience in that area. Absolutely, I think it's about ensuring that the examiners have the contextual sophistication as it relates to the products and services that are being offered by the the financial institution, but through their their fintechs, and then on the other side, ensuring that the banks and the fintechs understand where they're fitting within the regulatory structure and how they're being uh, examined or regulated because there's uh, a lot of direct regulation of banks, obviously, but there's indirect regulation of fintech companies. And so the, the best fintech companies are compliance first and really focus on trying to develop that. And that's what, you know, at AFC, we're, we're looking for those members that are, that are responsible, that are compliance first, that are focused on saying, hey, look, we're a team here, uh, you know, between the bank and the fintech. And there, there's opportunities there to ensure that across the board, that the, the regulations are being implemented and complied with and ultimately for the benefit of the consumers. So that's uh, that concept of compliance first fintechs, I think is going to be a theme that's going to uh, manifest itself in the form of natural selection here. If, uh, if, if fintechs don't do that, they're not going to be around. Right. So let's, Let's look forward then now to, to 2024 here a little bit. Ian, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Um, great, great perspective. And we look forward to having you back on a, on a future episode. Wonderful. Thanks, Ed. Greatly appreciate it.